Hey everyone, in this session we're going to talk about glycogen metabolism, also known as glycogenolysis. So in a previous session we've talked about glycogen synthesis and how it's produced. Now in this session we're going to talk about how it's broken down and utilized. And we're also going to talk about the advantages and disadvantages of glycogen metabolism. So as a reminder, here is what glycogen actually looks like. As you remember, it's a highly complex and branching structure. And because of it, one of the main advantages of glycogenolysis is that it can be used as a rapid energy source. And that's because it is highly branched. It uh, has a lot of points where a glucose can be released. Now, another advantage is that it is anaerobically generated. The energy from a glycogen store can be actually generated anaerobically. We do not need oxygen. And another advantage is that it actually generates three ATP per glucose from a glycogen molecule, whereas only 2 ATP are generated from a non-glycogen glucose source. And I'll explain to you why that is in a moment. Now, the, some of the disadvantages of glycogenolysis is that only a low amount of ATP can be generated per mass of glycogen. And that's because glycogen, because it's a carbohydrate, it absorbs a lot of water. It has a lot of mass as opposed to something like adipose tissue, which is anhydrous. So we cannot generate a large amount of ATP for the size of glycogen. And another disadvantage of glycogenolysis is that it is a limited storage capacity and it typically only lasts about 24 hours. So glycogen has separate roles depending on the tissue it's utilized in. In muscle, it is used as a rapid source of energy. During exercise or physical activity, glycogen is used as an energy source in the muscle. But in the liver, glycogen is actually used to maintain blood glucose levels and this is important during fasting and also be, uh, during the periods between meals. So how does glycogenolysis or glycogen metabolism begin? Well it begins with the enzyme glycogen phosphorylase and glycogen phosphorylase is one of the many enzymes that require pyridoxal phosphate which is a derivative of vitamin B6. Now what glycogen phosphorylase does is it targets a free end of glycogen and it does it by actually targeting an alpha-1,4 glycosidic bond. And in the process, it releases a glucose-1 phosphate. So glycogen phosphorylase will keep removing a glucose-1 phosphate from a branch of glycogen. But one of the key characteristics of glycogen phosphorylase is that it actually stops within four residues of a branch point due to size and steric hindrance of the enzyme. So that means that the glycogen phosphorylase cannot keep removing residues off of a glycogen branch. So how does the cell continue to metabolize the glycogen? Well it continues to metabolize the glycogen by utilizing another enzyme, the debranching enzyme. And the debranching enzyme has a couple of functions. One, it acts as a transferase. So the debranching enzyme will move three residues from a branch, one branch, and move it to the free end of another branch. So that would help to reduce the steric hindrance on the glycogen phosphorylase. However, the debranching enzyme also has another function, and it functions as a glucosidase to hydrolyze an alpha-1,6 bond, a branching point. Because, as you remember, the glycogen phosphorylase can only act on an alpha-1,4 glycosidic bond. So the debranching enzyme can take care of the branch points on a glycogen and hydrolyze an alpha-1,6 bond. And when it does hydrolyze an alpha-1,6 bond, the glucose or the residue released from the glycogen is actually released as a free glucose, not a glucose 1-phosphate. So that is one important point to remember. So as we've learned, glycogen can be processed back into glucose 1-phosphate by the enzyme glycogen phosphorylase. And as we've learned in a previous lesson, the glucose 1-phosphate can be used to produce glycogen with the help of glycogen synthase. So how do these two enzymes oppose each other and how do the regulations differ on these enzymes? Well, the first thing is that insulin is an activator of glycogen synthase through another protein phosphatase, which we won't get into here, but just remember that insulin will actually activate glycogen synthase. Now, glucagon and epinephrine will actually inhibit glycogen synthase through protein kinase A, and this is through a phosphorylation mechanism. So glucagon and epinephrine lead to the phosphorylation and inhibition of glycogen synthase. AMPK can also inhibit glycogen synthase with, through phosphorylation as well. 
Now, the difference with regulation on glycogen synthase as opposed to glycogen phosphorylase is that insulin actually inhibits glycogen phosphorylase through a protein phosphatase as well. But it's the opposite with glucagon and epinephrine. Glucagon and epinephrine will actually activate a phosphorylase kinase to phosphorylate and activate glycogen phosphorylase. So the important point to get out of this is that phosphorylation activates glycogen phosphorylase, whereas phosphorylation inhibits glycogen synthase. And an easy way to remember this is that phosphorylation activates phosphorylase. Phosphorylation, phosphorylase. So hopefully that helps. So the two main areas in the body that utilize glycogen are the liver and skeletal muscle. And we've learned some of the regulation on glycogen metabolism in the previous slide, but I'm going to get into a little bit more detail in these slides and how the regulation on glycogen differs between the liver and skeletal muscle. So as we've learned before, glycogen phosphorylase can process glycogen residues into glucose 1-phosphate, and glucose 1-phosphate can be utilized to form glycogen with the enzyme glycogen synthase. And which direction this goes in depends on regulation within the cell. And with glycogen phosphorylase, glycogen phosphorylase is inhibited by indicators of energy, such as ATP. It's also inhibited by glucose 6-phosphate, and it's inhibited by glucose. So anything that shows the cell that there does not need to be any breakdown of glycogen will actually stop the process of glycogen phosphorylase. Now, the opposite in glycogen synthase is glucose 6-phosphate will actually activate glycogen synthase. So glucose 6-phosphate will inhibit the phosphorylase, but it will activate the synthase. So in a liver hepatocyte, when the cell decides that it requires glycogenolysis and produces glucose 1-phosphate, the glucose 1-phosphate will actually be processed by the enzyme phosphoglucomutase back into glucose 6-phosphate. And then the glucose 6-phosphate will then be processed by the enzyme glucose 6-phosphatase to produce glucose in gluconeogenesis. So this production of glucose for gluconeogenesis only occurs in the liver due to glucose 6-phosphatase enzyme, which is only present in the liver. Um, it is present a little bit in the kidneys, but majority is present in the liver. Now, in skeletal muscle, it's the same thing as we've seen before, but the regulation is slightly different. With glycogen synthase, it's the same. Glucose 6-phosphate will activate glycogen synthase to reroute glucose 1-phosphate into glycogen storage. Now, for glycogen phosphorylase, it's the same for ATP. ATP will inhibit glycogen phosphorylase. The glucose 6-phosphate will also inhibit glycogen phosphorylase, but there are a couple additional regulators on this enzyme in skeletal muscle. One of them is calcium. Calcium will actually activate glycogen phosphorylase. So you can think about if you're exercising and contracting your muscles, you're getting an influx of calcium. Calcium will then actually activate glycogen phosphorylase so that you start to break down your glycogen stores. And then another activator of glycogen phosphorylase is AMP. And AMP is another indicator of physical activity. As you burn through your ATP stores, you produce AMP, which then will activate glycogen phosphorylase to produce more glucose 1-phosphate. Now, glucose 1-phosphate, once you have glucose 1-phosphate, will then produce glucose 6-phosphate with the enzyme phosphoglucomutase. But the difference between skeletal muscle and the liver is that the glucose 6-phosphate will then be used for glycolysis to produce energy as opposed to gluconeogenesis in the liver. So that's why you see the dual roles of glycogenolysis and glycogen utilization in these two tissues, the liver and the skeletal muscle. So another point I want to mention is that 3-ATP are generated for every glucose from a glycogen as opposed to non-glycogen glucose. And the reason is, is because when you actually process a, res a residue of glycogen, we end up getting the product glucose 6-phosphate, which is already phosphorylated. So in a normal cell, when we bring glucose into the cell, the cell actually has to phosphorylate the glucose into glucose 6-phosphate, which actually costs 1 ATP. Whereas with glycogen, this is already done. It's already been phosphorylated. So we've actually invested that ATP already previously. And now when we bring it back out of storage, you actually get more ATP. When you bring 
glucose out of storage from glycogen, it is actually already phosphorylated and it's already glucose 6-phosphate, which means it does not need to be phosphorylated, saving the cell 1 ATP. So that's why we actually get an extra ATP, 3 ATP as opposed to 2 ATP. Anyways, guys, I hope you found this lesson helpful. If you did, please like and subscribe for more videos like this one. And as always, thank you so much for watching and have a great day.